Professor, please. I would like to speak a few words on temperance. That's fine. Keep it down there. Ladies and gentlemen, down with rum. Ever since the beginning of time, there has been a drink problem. Quite a problem. Even a greater problem now, it's so scarce. Throughout the Middle Ages, the use of liquor was universal, and drunkenness was so common, it was unnoticed. They called it the Middle Ages, because no one was able to walk home unless they were between two other fellows. I was usually the middle guy. But through the years, enlightenment came, and with it, the control of spiritus fermenti. And controlling spiritus fermenti is tougher than tying a hair ribbon on a bolt of lightning. <laughs> That's a good simile. The first instance of federal authority in this country was when George Washington put down the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania, A. I imagine George put down a little of the vile stuff, too. <laughs> there was a fellow that really lived. What a guy, what a man. Now, before I go any further, please do not labor under the misconception that I always have been a teetotaler. No. In my younger days, I was prone to take a nip. I chortle now at the former weakness in my otherwise strong character. But how well I remember my first encounter with a devil's brew. Devil's brew. I happened to stumble across a case of bourbon, and I went right on stumbling for several days thereafter. Of course, now, I touch nothing stronger than buttermilk. Ninety proof buttermilk. I look on my days of reverie with scorn and reproachment and shudder when I recall going to the corner saloon, tugging at my daddy's coattails and saying, Father, dear father, come home with me now and bring a jug with you. However, I came from a very illustrious family. My great-grandfather was a friend of Benjamin Franklin's. In fact, my great-grandfather would have discovered electricity, but he was too poor to buy a kite. He had to go out and hire one. I have a picture of him at home, standing in front of the town tavern, he was higher than a kite, much higher. Wonderful man, Grandfather. They called him the Atomic Bomb. Bomb, B-U-M, Bomb. Now many of you are giggling and scoffing and saying that I have given up strong drink only because the stuff is so hard to get nowadays. But you are in error. My basement is loaded, as I uh, uh, was. Um, uh, friends, my heart bleeds when I think that right at this moment, throughout our fair land, thousands of misguided souls are hitting the bottle. Yes, they are consuming rivers of highballs, lakes of cocktails, and oceans of distilled damnation. I think I'll slip on my bathing suit. Yes, liquid death and distilled damnation. That's what they are a-swillin' and a-guzzlin'. A pickpocket I once converted told me they have a school in Chicago. Ill. Ill, short for Illinois. A pocket-picking school. 
I'll have to go out and get one for this cold of mine. And the beginning rule they teach is no stimulants. They have to keep their heads clear and their fingers nimble. My friends, you set a bucket of beer in front of a pig, and he'll grunt and walk away. So should you. Or would you rather be a duck? Remember, the joys of alcohol are fleeting, and the toll is terrible. Back in my rummy days, I would tremble and shake for hours upon a rising. It was the only exercise I ever got. A man who overindulges lives in a dream. He becomes conceited. He thinks the whole world revolves around him. And it usually does. So, friends, my advice to you is to abstain. Break all the bottles in your possession. Now, don't say you can't swear off drinking. It's easy. I've done it a thousand times. One must be careful in making resolutions, particularly New Year's resolutions. The trouble lies in the fact that most of us are inclined to put off resolutions until 11 a.m. New Year's morning. This is a bad time to think of reform. Remorse runs rampant at such times, and we are liable to consign ourselves to all sorts of extravagant penances such as hying ourselves to monasteries in Tibet or Afghanistan or to spending our remaining days in Azusa, Cucamonga or Lumpak. I myself was a victim of the 11 a.m. menace several years ago. The evening preceding January the 1st, I was invited to a party by a couple who intended to get married, which they did, but not to each other. I awoke New Year's Day to find a full-grown goat in bed beside me. <laughs> Worse than that, my head felt as though a manhole cover were resting on it. Imagine my surprise when I reached up and found out there was a manhole cover resting on my head. Right then and there, I swore that I would never again poison my system with maraschino cherries. Two weeks later, I slipped and had another. But you must believe me when I say I thought it was a seedless grape I washed it down with some snake bite remedy, which I always keep handy. Only, however, after first being bitten by a snake, which I also keep handy. Those who overindulge in strong drink always have serpents handy. In fact, some hapless souls are burdened with them as constant companions. In my time, I can remember the company of many assorted reptiles. In addition to pink elephants with lavender dots, a bright blue ostrich with a mixmaster for a tail, and a short bruise octopus that taught me to samba or samba, as we say over home. A thief broke into my house one night and stole my octopus. He cut his tentacles off and used them for non-skid automobile tires. A cruel thing to do. I wish I had a thought of it. In closing, I would like to offer my favorite recipe to take the place of intoxicants. It's real thirst quencher. It's called the Raspberry Freeze, known in England as the Raspberry Freeze. Take one cup of pineapple juice, 
two cups of raspberry juice, raspberry juice, mind you, if you're in Europe, one cup of black tea, three cups of water, and two egg whites. Freeze until half stiff. Well, when you're half stiff, everything is all right. I thank you. It is a sunny California afternoon, and we find W.C. Field seated on his patio, strumming his guitar, as he is being interviewed by Miss Ophelia Snapdorp of the Lompoc Bugle. It's nice of you to grant me this interview, Mr. Field. Think nothing of it, my beauty. I'm always glad to speak for the public print. Well, I think I have about all I need. There's just one more question, Mr. Fields. What is it, my beauty? Is it true that you once drank a glass of water? <coughs> God, what an accusation. I haven't had a drop of water on my tongue since the gold rush days. I was up in Nome, Alaska, and I made the mistake of picking my teeth with an icicle. The icicle melted and I nearly strangled to death. Those were the happy days. I hope they'll never come again. I crossed the frozen tundra with my trusty dog team, which I ate later. They were very good with whipped cream. At long last, I arrived at the igloo of an Eskimo friend of mine, who distilled a delectable beverage from whale blubber. Well, that's all very interesting. But uh, when did you drink the glass of water? Oh, yes, you remember that, don't you? The water. That was 35 years ago. And I was talking to Tex Rickard and Death Valley Scotty in the old Victoria Hotel bar. I left the cafe and walked down Broadway. I must have been uh, thinking. For the next thing I knew, I was struck by a runaway street organ in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, the entrepreneur of this musical cavalcade, an Italian gentleman, was most profuse in his apologies. His poor frightened monkey bit me in the stomach in his excitement. Uh, were you ever bitten in the stomach by a wild monkey? No. Oh. I was rushed to the hospital. Soon after being hospitalized, I took a turn for the nurse, a uh, worse. My nurse, Miss Dorothea Fizzledaco, was pretty, starched and blonde, with cheeks like peaches and cream, which I had for breakfast every morning. Things went along smoothly until one day when my doctor entered my room to find that I had a half Nelson on Miss Fizzledaco in an effort to rest a vial of rubbing alcohol from her determined grip. Uh, Miss Fizzledaco was immediately replaced by a male nurse. I recently received a postcard from Dorothea in a bottle. She is in one of the Cuckoo Islands in the Pacific, perfectly happy, except that a mosquito carried off a pet dog while she was napping on the beach. But what about your drinking the water? Oh, yes, you back to that again, yes. I was driving across the Mojave Desert in search of the lonesome Charlie gold mine. And by chance, I happened to come upon the Happy Buzzard gas station and tap room. I entered the tap room and said to the barkeep, the double slug of red eye, please. He replied, Sorry, no liquor, partner. What of the sign that swings outside proclaiming the happy buzzard? How can a buzzard be happy without a nip? Well, this is election day, partner, and oh. the bar is closed. It's the law. Who made this law? Well, the people voted for it. That's carrying democracy too far. Well, if you're so thirsty... How about a nice glass of water? Are you insane? Say, ain't you W.C. Fields? No autographs, please. I guess I am insane. 
asking you to drink a glass of water. Well, I'd bet a hundred dollars you wouldn't do that. Of course I would. Did you say one hundred dollars? A century note? Yep. Get your money up. Okay. Here's my money and here's your glass of water. <laughs> Hideous looking stuff. Don't you put an olive or a cherry or some formaldehyde in it? Nope. Just plain water. All right. I'll drink it. May the state of Kentucky forgive me. Well, <clears throat> here's over the lip. Well, I must be seeing things. W.C. Fields is reaching for a glass of water. He's lifting it from the bar. There it goes up to his lips and there goes my hunter. He's just starting to drink. No, no, he's putting it back in the bar. Whoops, he's lifting it to his lips again. He grits his teeth. Fuck, Cracky, he's... He's a-drinking that water. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mr. Fields, Mr. Fields, what's wrong? Oh, get a doctor, you idiot. That's been poison. Ah! Oh! 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 